Namaste and a very warm welcome to this meditation. We've done three meditations together. In this one, we're going to be looking at Namaste and a very warm welcome to this meditation. We've done meditations together. In this one, we're going to look at the fundamental tenets of Raj Yoga by Patanjali. The great sage laid down certain principles of life by which we can seek out a life of meditativeness. To put this in context, what Raja Yoga, as one of the limbs of yoga, says is that when you set your life in order, when you set the house in order, meditation happens. I'd like to make this point before we start. Meditation is not a technique that you do. Rather, it is the result of putting your life in order. With Patanjali, he lays down a whole set of ground rules that if you follow, you will find that you're naturally gravitating towards being meditative in every aspect of your day, of your life. Without further ado, let's get started. If you're sitting on the floor, as we saw, Siddh Asana, one leg at the perineum between anal and genital space, that's where the heel is. The other leg can be here or can be here. For a woman, it's called Siddh Yoni Asana. For a man, it's called Siddh Asana. If you're finding this difficult, just sit in a cross leg position, Sukhasana. You can also just sit on a chair, even that is fine. If you need the back support, you can take it even on a wall. Now that you're sitting straight, let's see what has to be done with the hands. We take up this mudra, touching the index finger to the thumb. I'd suggest to put your palms flat like this. Take the tip of your tongue to touch the soft upper palate, Ketri Mudra. Close your eyes and focus above the eyebrow center, Shambhavi Mudra. Now that you're in a meditative posture, let's focus on our breathing. Patanjali calls this an asana, Sthira Sukha Asana, steady, comfortable pose, seat, from where you can contemplate life. So once you're steady now, let's start to look at what we can do with our breath. So inhale, hold, with the eyes closed, exhale. Inhale, hold, exhale, inhale, exhale. Here's the background of our meditation today. Patanjali lays down an eight limbs, eight stage ladder. Ashtang, eight limbs of yoga. Yama, personal observances, also Niyama. Then comes Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahar, sense withdrawal. These five are external yoga. The next three, Dharan, concentration, Dhyan, meditation, Samadhi, a dissolution of sense of limited self. These three are Antarang, internal yoga. Together, these eight stages constitute the journey. The genius of Patanjali, 2,500 years after his time, it is still a valid way of attaining the divine. What we are going to focus on today in our meditation 
is the yamas and niyamas. There are five yamas and five niyamas. To put this in context, if you cheat somebody, you're not going to be peaceful and calm here. Therefore, these are basic observances of life that if you take care of these ten, Pai Yama, Pai Niyama, you can be still in the body, you can be still and silent in the mind, and you can be a receptacle, you can be receiving everything that is the cosmos. Shall we get started? So sitting straight, you keep breathing in and out deeply as you listen and contemplate these ten. They belong to the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali in the second chapter. One, Niyama, Satya, Truthfulness. Now this is not merely that you're not lying, but are you living a life that is truthful? Meaning, is your life in sync with your highest ideals, truths of life. To put it another way, are you in a relationship, are you in a career that is in sync with your highest ideals of life? If you are not, you can never be at peace, you can never be complete relaxed. Satya, a life of truthfulness. For the next five breaths, contemplate any aspect of your life where you're not living truthfully. The next, ahimsa, non-violence. Non-violence doesn't just mean that you're not going and hitting somebody. You may not have the physical prowess to hit somebody, but you may try to malign their reputation by talking badly about them, you may be jealous towards somebody. In some way, you have a certain sense of violence towards somebody whether you express it as physical damage or just doing something to hurt them or their reputation. If you have no such thing, no malice towards anyone, then you're in a state of ahimsa. So let's spend the next five breaths checking whether anybody makes us angry. Often we find the people closest in our life, our life partner, triggers that in us. Let us try and see how that himsa violence is in us, it's in you. It's just being triggered by someone, but it is in you. What is it in me? Often it could be a perfection complex that if somebody behaves differently, I am violent towards that person. I am willing to shout, scream, hit, because of my own perceptions. 
increasingly Patanjali is showing us that all of this is within us. Next five breaths, checking whether ahimsa is deeply rooted or not within us. Satya, Ahimsa, these are the two tenets that Gandhiji lived by. You find them the first two in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. Gandhi is referred to as a Karma Yogi and yet he had a deep influence of Raj Yoga. The next that we look at is Brahmacharya, literally God-like behavior, meaning a non-obsession with sex or non-lustfulness. You could be celibate or you could be a householder, but as long as you're not obsessed with it, it's not ruling your mind, you're not lustful, you're fine. Let us be aware in the next five breaths whether we are genuinely at peace, contentment or our lustful mind is making us run in a direction that is not true to us. We do many things in life to satisfy this urge. Some of them are unhealthy to us in the long term. Therefore, for five breaths, let's explore our relationship with lust and whether we can be brahmacharyas or being non-lustful, either householder or not. I hope that's clear for all, non-lustful. You could be a family person, that's fine. And having a healthy relationship with sex is fine. Oftentimes, people, priests and monks are forced to be celibate and they end up doing weird things, molesting and so on. So this is what Patanjali is saying, to overcome lust, either as a householder or as a celibate. Moving on to the fourth, asteya, non-stealing. This doesn't mean that you're not stealing from a shop or material things from a person but oftentimes we see that we take things that don't rightfully belong to us. This could be appreciation in a couple or in a team at work. The whole team does the work together. One person just tells the story and takes all the credit, all the appreciation, hogs the limelight. He's stealing what is due to everyone. This happens a lot in couples, this happens a lot at the workplace. Can we spend the next five breaths visualizing the last time we did that and hurt somebody in the process?
the last, the fifth of the yamas, we have seen satya, ahimsa, brahmacharya, asteya, non-stealing, aparigraha, non-holding of things, non-obsession with material objects. If you have a million things and you are attached to all of them, you have split your mind into a million pieces. This is the antithesis of what you are trying to do with meditation, to unify, to become one, to bring all of you to be one. Your body, mind, emotions to move in one direction. If you split yourself into a million minds, million pieces, you will never have, you will never be able to be uni or rather focused in anything in life. You're too dissipated. Bringing that solidarity within of you, it's important to not be too attached to the material things you have. You can either have it all and not be attached or you can even practice minimalism. And I don't mean the kind of minimalism where you had a thousand things, now you have fifty things, but you're so obsessed about those fifty that you cannot share, cannot be a part. Those fifty are ruling you. You can either be minimalist or have it all, but those things shouldn't rule you. So for the next five, min five breaths, just be aware. Is there anything that you're terribly attached to? For a lot of us it can be our mobile phone, and please don't make or give yourself any justifications. Don't say, this is for my work, or this is for my children, or this is for so-and-so. In a non-judgmental way, anything that you're tremendously attached to. Let's do a simple meditation for all these five before we move on to Niyama. So be aware, moving from the space above your eyebrows down, descending into your heart space. To commit to living truthfully in everything you do, thought, word, deed. Commit to relinquishing violence towards anyone or anything. Commit to overcoming lust and having a healthy relationship with love. Committing to a sense of abundance so you don't have to steal from anyone. Again, to a sense of abundance, so that you don't have to hold or be connected to the things you have. Nature is giving us so abundantly. Why are we then acting like watchmen for the things that we have? And in your heart space, visualize yourself sharing everything you have with everyone you know. Moving on to the five Niyamas, the first is Saucha, cleanliness. If your house, room, cupboard, desk are not clean, it's tough to have an organized mind. If your body is not clean, it's tough to have an organized mind. Cleanliness of the body-mind is very important. For the next five breaths, be aware of anything that you feel is unclean in you. This lowers your resolve, your own assessment of yourself, if you feel that you are unclean.
And now, be aware of contentment, santosha, second niyama. Are you content about the way you look? your finances, your career, your relationships, everything in your life. Because if you're not content, you cannot be peaceful. You can be content and ambitious, of course. But you've got to be content every day with where you are. This contentment is very important. Be aware to see whether you are genuinely content. If there's an aspect that you know you're not content, let's come to work on it and not ignore it. It'll come back and hit you later in life, so let's work on it. Whether it's your health, your finances, your relationships, let's work on it. Santosha. The next one that we look at is Tapa. Are you able to take on some hardship? It could mean skipping one meal in a week. It could mean getting up at a certain time. It could mean anything. Some hardship can you take on so that you train your willpower, your spiritual willpower. Every religious system Islam has Ramadan, Christianity has Lent, we have the Navratris in Hinduism. Every system has some fasting period so that you develop a little bit of vilpa. Otherwise, we do exactly what our mind wants us to do, tells us to do. Therefore, can we take on one tapas? For the next five breaths, just visualize one thing that you can do every week so that you develop this bit of vilpa in you. Do something out of your comfort zone. We have seen Saucha, we have seen Santosha, we have seen Tapa. Let us see Swadhyay, self-study. If I journal, if I start to track my own life, I begin to understand certain patterns in my mind. For example, a common pattern that we all have is regret. If you are not watchful, you start to regret something and that takes you, you may be brushing your teeth, taking a bath, but you're regretting something you did yesterday. And this can go on and on and on. Therefore, it's very important to study the patterns of your mind. Just as your body feels hungry every few hours, the mind may feel jealous every few days, violent every few days, and so on. You should just understand these patterns. Knowing these patterns will show you that there is a certain distance between you and your mind. This distance is very important to train. If you can watch your mind, it means it, your mind is not all of you. To study these patterns, we journal. For the next five breaths, just begin to be aware. Is there any pattern of your mind you've discovered? For example, your response to desert, sweets, or your response to anything else. Why does this happen? Is this a pattern? Is your body looking for it? Is your mind looking for it? Look at all of this. Patterns, Swadhyay. Now, be aware 
of Ishwar Pranidhan, surrender to a higher entity. Whatever you consider a higher entity, Patanjali describes Ishwar as that which is beyond afflictions. For us, we are always afflicted by pain, sorrow, so many things. That which is beyond affliction, that which is beyond time. The guru to the earliest gurus, meaning to say beyond time. Whatever that may be for you, whether it's God, whether it's nature, whatever, whatever is a higher entity for you, are you able to surrender to life and not constantly battle life? Are you a kind of person who says, okay, this is what happened. Life is sometimes bigger than me. It's always bigger than me. And I relinquish the control. Surrender makes you deeply powerful. We don't know this till we experience it. Now, let's do a simple meditation for these five Niyama, Saucha, Santosha, Tapa, Swadhyaya and Ishwar Pranidhan. Once again, I invite you to descend from the eyebrow center to your heart space to a golden warm golden light in your heart space to visualize yourself lying in Shavasana like a child in the lap of nature in a state that's absolutely in surrender defenseless to mother nature committing to be clean in body mind to be content with where you are to take on a little bit of hardship regularly to study your own patterns of mind and body and to surrender to life it's been an absolute pleasure to lead you through this unique meditation where we've discussed Patanjali's Yama Niyama. Once these ten have been taken care of, you can sit still. Yoga means where you are is where you want to be. It's very, very important in life that whatever you're doing, that is exactly what you want to be doing. You're nowhere else. That can happen when these ten have been taken care of. Then you are in our sun. You are stira sukha everywhere in life. Then your breath becomes pranayam. It's the breath of life, prana. Then pratyahar happens. Your senses turn inwards. The internal journey has begun. Then focus is natural for you, dharana. And then dhyan happens to you. You don't have to fight it. It is your nature, meditation. And finally, you experience Samadhi. I wish you all the best on this journey. I look forward to meeting you in a future meditation. Thanks for letting me guide you. Namaste. sitting for two more minutes.